Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in our Going Deep segment brought to you by CO2 Lift, we're featuring Dr. Michelle Henry, a board-certified dermatologic surgeon, speaker, trainer, and author. She serves as the CEO and founder of Skin and Aesthetic Surgery of Manhattan, as well as the founder of the Henry Research Group. She focuses on high-risk skin cancer treatments, cosmetic surgery, hair loss solutions, and skin rejuvenation techniques. She has contributed significantly to the medical community through her extensive publications, authoring numerous articles and book chapters on dermatology. Today, she joins me to chat all about debunking skincare, over-the-counter, what we call OTC, versus medical-grade products. Now, inflation drove the cost of everything up as of lately, from gasoline to eggs and beyond. This has many people wondering if it's worth it to drop extra bucks on medical-grade skincare when there are so many less expensive over-the-counter options out there. The skincare industry is big business, and it's set to jump from a worldwide valuation of $100 billion in 2021 to $145 billion in 2028. That's a whole lot of creams, cleansers, and wrinkle reducers. So how do we pick the right products without compromising our beauty and bank? Well, our expert at hand is right here to guide us. We're excited to have her help us navigate the often confusing world of skincare products. We're chatting debunking skincare over the counter versus medical grade with the beautiful Dr. Henry. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thrilled to be here. Absolutely. So excited to chat with you today. So you actively serve on multiple medical boards. You conduct FDA clinical trials, act as the U.S. consulting dermatologist for Kiehl's, and are a member of the product validation board at L'Oreal. Yes. You are a distinguished fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology, American Society of Dermatologic Surgery, and American College of Mohs Surgery. Now, one would definitely call you an expert. (laughs) Can you briefly explain the key differences between over-the-counter, what we call OTC skincare products, and medical-grade skincare products? Yes. So the primary distinction is in the concentration of the ingredient. So medical grade, in the same way that we look at pharmaceutical grade uh, medications, they have been better studied. So we have actual data. The concentration of the ingredients is much higher. Because of that, it's medical grade. So it's distributed through a physician because you need guidance to make sure that you're not using these super concentrated ingredients in a way that might harm your skin. And so for me, I sell medical grade products in my office. I will not have a product in my office until I've seen your papers. I've seen your data. It's approaching the level of studies that we're almost seeing with pharmaceutical grade products. And that's really important. So if I'm a dermatologist and I'm promising you, I'm offering you the best When you're coming to me, you've tried everything else. So I have to offer you a solution that's going to give you results either faster or better than what you can access on your own. Now, I say that to say, I love how you said about there's inflation. Does that mean that everyone has to pay the big dollars to get good skincare? Not necessarily. In the same way that you can get to the same place in a Ferrari versus a Corolla, you know, they're both going to get you there, but the timeline is going to be a little bit different. You know, the um, (laughs) the accessories are going to be a little bit different. So there's great over the counter skincare. But if you want something that might get you there a little bit faster, may get you there a little bit more elegantly. If you are at your wits end, then you're going to want to graduate to something that's medical grade. That's a great analogy. I love how you put it simply like that. You, you, you know, when you translate it into cars, now we all get it, right? <laughs> um, so it's also a question of regulation, I think, because labels are deceiving. I mean, mm-hmm. for example, food and, and products labeled as organic are mm-hmm. regulated to meet certain standards, but the word natural, mm-hmm. right, has no such stringent requirements to meet. It's, it's sort of the same for skincare products. You know, as pharmaceutical products, medical grade skincare is strictly regulated by the Food and Drug Administration to meet certain standards for both effectiveness and safety. So if a product says it reduces fine lines by altering the body structure, Mm -hmm. to your point, it should have proof to back it up, usually via clinical trials. Um, And, you know, my issue is these over-the-counter skincare products. However, they they don't have such requirements. So if a product simply, you know... For example, products that simply moisturize or perform other surface level cosmetic tasks are not considered pharmaceutical, so they're not regulated in the same way. So I always would like to opt for the medical grade stuff to your point. Now, is there a difference in the level of active ingredients that are allowed to be offered over the counter? So 
So I will say this, that medical grade is still not FDA approved. It's just collectively, when we allow something to be labeled as a community medical grade, we have a higher expectation for it. So it's not quite at the level of a pharmaceutical grade product, but the expectation around it and the backing around it in terms of physicians actually having it in our office means that it's going to have better clinical studies. It's going to at least have clinical studies because over-the-counter doesn't have to. Now, what is also expected of it is that, yes, the active ingredients are going to be higher. You know, it comes at a higher price point. And you can't just tell us or patients, you know, everything I offer a patient, my entire reputation is on it. So if I tell you that this is better, that is my entire career that I'm hanging in this one encounter. So it better have it in there. So yes, the ingredients are going to be higher. They're going to be, um, they're going to have better vehicles, meaning that it has to penetrate. So in skincare, you could have the best ingredients, but if they can't get in the skin, you just spent all of your money on something that's just sitting on top of your skin and not doing the work. So it has to have a vehicle that can get into the skin. If we think about our skin, our skin is a barrier. It's made to keep things out. It's made to waterproof our body, keep the good things in and keep the bad things out. So for a product to actually get in, it has to be quite smart. And a smart product has to be um, based on good technology. Now, as technology advances, better technology becomes cheaper, but it's a rat race. There's always something new coming out. So you can get fantastic over-the-counter products. And I recommend them all the time because not all of my patients can afford medical grade skincare. So I have to give a range. So you can get good products at a lower cost, but you have to know where to look. You have to know what technology is real. You have to know what brands are legit and you have to know who is trying to give you good science and good products. Well, I'm a big endorser of purchasing uh, the products directly from the dermatology mm-hmm. office or from the doctor's office, because to your point, the major difference between OTC and, and medical grade skincare is how they are purchased, because mm-hmm. OTC products can be bought at any number of retail establishments, right, exactly. including your corner drugstore, while medical grade items with all their concentrated goodness, mm-hmm. to your point, are typically bought at derm offices or maybe even online. Of course, there are some prescription only acne and other mm-hmm. medications that require an RX, but those are next level and don't fall into either category. So yeah, I'm, I'm, if you can afford it, buy it from your, from your physician's Absolutely. office. Now, what about benign ingredients? What are the top trending ingredients in skincare today? And is there a difference in trends between OTC and medical? Yeah, for sure. You know, a lot of, when I think about a lot of the medical grade companies, they have amazing research. You look at companies like L'Oreal, who has a, a huge investment in research development and the finances to do close to pharmaceutical grade research. They're making their own ingredients. They have proprietary ingredients. It's very hard for a lot of like, you know, indie or like, you know, lower cost um, over the counter brands to, to compete with some of these a bigger brands or medical grade brands under the umbrella of these bigger brands. Um, so, you know, you want to really make sure that you are um, you're looking at the brand, but the ingredients that we're looking for, kind of these ingredients that are easy to access are some that you've heard. I'll talk about some that you've heard that are still popular and some that are new. So one hyaluronic acid, hyaluronic acid is, is everywhere. It is easy to make really fantastic, inexpensive hyaluronic acid products. So the ones you're seeing over the counter can be really fantastic. Those are ingredients that you can get a fantastic hyaluronic acid serum over the counter. Niacinamide is everywhere. So niacinamide is um, basically vitamin B3. It's great for brightening. So it's great for brightening all skin types. So everyone can use it, whether you're dark or you're fair, it's gonna help to even out your skin tone. It's really well tolerated. So we see that everywhere. Retinol, 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 retinol. I, I mean, I love retinol. I feel like if you could tolerate it, you should be using it. Retinol has been around forever. So technology has gotten such that we can make pretty good, stable retinol over the counter. So you can get great retinol comp, um, products over the counter. Now there are some other products that are a little bit newer and becoming popular. So like snail mucin. Snail mucin is coming in from Korea, super popular ingredient. Snail mucin is essentially snail slime. It's that slime that we see when the snail is moving. But what does it have in it? It has hyaluronic acid. It has some glycolic acid. It has some antimicrobial. So anti- you know, it's going to kill some bacteria. It has peptides in it. So it's a fantastic ingredient. Um, we're seeing more natural ingredients and more botanicals out there as well. So we're looking to harness science to get the best out of the natural world, because that's really um, a hot topic as well and uh, invested interest. Um, Tranexamic acid, you're going to see a lot of that. And that's a long, scary word that scares people, but we've been using it in medicine forever for many other reasons. Um, But now we realize that it's anti-inflammatory and it can really help with brightening the skin. So another really popular ingredient that as technology has gotten better, it's gotten cheaper to make. So it's exiting medical grade and now we're seeing it over the counter. So lots of interesting things on the market now. 
Fantastic. You're like the Durham Encyclopedia. <laughs> Jesus, you are incredible. Now, I, I want to talk about a new product, um, not new product, I'm sorry. I want to talk about a new uh, ingredient, if you will, that's mm -hmm. been around. Uh, it's newly trending, but it's been around since the 1930s. So it's carbon mm -hmm. dioxide as yes. an ingredient. So when we know that through through studies, but even in the 1930s, when infused into the skin, CO2 immediately diffuses at the cutaneous and muscular microcirculatory mm -hmm. levels, resulting in higher tissue oxygenation and neoangiogenesis. And the blood vessels widen. It increases the transport of oxygen body tissues for cellular regeneration and anti-inflammatory effects. I'm curious to know, what do you think about carbon dioxide as an ingredient and as a treatment therapy? I think it's fantastic. And I think that in many ways it's underutilized. If we think about just how we breathe and gas exchange and how we evolved, we were evolved on this like CO2 oxygen curve. That's how we do everything that we do. That is what human life is. And so it's it's it makes sense that it would have such profound wound healing properties, such just profound um, properties in terms of vascularization, which is critical to having healthy skin and healthy tissue. And so bringing this over to beauty is kind of natural. You know, we've been using it in wound healing for a really long time. You know, um, we don't do carboxytherapy where we're infusing CO2 into the skin, actual CO2, not through skincare as much in the States. But if you go to countries like that are the motherland of beauty, like Brazil, it's a really popular treatment and we use it for everything from skin um, rejuvenation to stretch marks. Um, so I do a lot of international speaking and when I'm sniffing around at all the international counters and seeing what's new and hot, CO2 has just been growing internationally for a long time. And so we have some CO2 over the counter products as well and medical grade products. And of course, medical grade is going to be the most effective. Um, one that I use in the office is called the CO2 lift. And so what happens is that when we put CO2 on the skin and this gel allows it to stay in the skin, what happens is there's a rush of oxygen. And we know that oxygen is critical to having healthy tissues everywhere. That's what we're looking to do. We're looking to increase blood circulation, get oxygen everywhere we can, because what does oxygen bring? Health, youthfulness, robust skin, healthy, robust tissue, um, helps to stimulate hydration. And so what this product does, and you can use it both on the face and below the waist, there's also vaginal treatments, um, but it's really helping to harness the body's capacity to heal and rejuvenate itself. Incredible information. Once again, now, since you said down there, the vaginal mm -hmm. part, let's talk about the new female trend, including yeah. skin down there. Yes. Uh, we have about a minute and a half left. How do you as a dermatologist help your patients with vaginal rejuvenation? Yes. Yeah, so as a dermatologist, I'm treating the whole patient. And as a dermatologist, as a female dermatologist, any female physician is a part of women's health. You know, like for me to ignore these conversations, um, I would be remiss as a physician. Um, and so this is a concern that patient that my patients are coming in for a their discomfort. So as women um, age and become perimenopausal or premenopausal, or as we're just changing throughout time and we're taking different medications, we have different things that happen, you start to get vaginal dryness. Um, and not only is it uncomfortable, but the appearance there can make a lot of women feel really insecure, right? And my job is to empower women through all avenues, through looking good, feeling good, and being comfortable. So it's a conversation I have in my office. Now, there are a lot of lasers and whatnot that claim to do this. You know, many are not FDA approved for that indication. It's become an area of controversy between aesthetic physicians and our gynecologists and, and the FDA, who's not quite sure what's safe, and what's not safe. So having something that's non-invasive that can still help to stimulate hydration you know, improve the, the comfort, um, potentially improve the thickness of the vaginal wall um, to make, you know, sex more comfortable, um, to increase the hydration of the labia, because, you know, that's also something women get insecure if that area looks different than it used to look. And, you know, it's a conversation we should feel comfortable talking about, right? Um, and so a lot of women are really happy to be able to use CO2 in that area um, where it's safe, it's something they could do at home, um, it's something that they have control over, to uh, improve their comfort and their their overall sexual wellness and um, confidence. Well, you said it all. I was going to say, you know, the CO2 Lift V, uh, it, I'd used it. And that was the first product I used with the uh, carboxy therapy. Mm -hmm. And the skin down there completely rejuvenated. I mean, mm -hmm. lifts, hydrates, rejuvenates. For me, it was just three applications. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about tightening and lifting it all, uh, it basically did that, you know. So yeah. for me, it was simple. It, enhancing circulation was critical to me. 
rushing that oxygen rich blood to tissue and regener regenerating your cells down there to improve sensitivity and lubrication. It, for me, it was a phenomenal over the counter, you know, very non-invasive type treatment. Um, all right, let's get to our bonus question. So, you know, you are really good at what you do. You're on top of your game. You're all about the clinical trials. You're all about the studies and the research. You're about backing the science. So the way we learn how to prevent, diagnose, and treat illness is via clinical research. And many different elements of scientific investigation are involved. It involves human participants and helps translate basic research done in labs into new treatments and information to benefit patients. What is your expectation as a provider on clinical research? And what is the difference between clinically proven and clinically studied? Yes, this is very, very important because something else I'm really invested in is truth in advertising. And that's whether it is truth in advertising of the physician or provider that you're seeing, truth in advertising of the claims of whether it's a pharmaceutical grade medication or an over-the-counter or medical grade medication. It is so important and so critical to what we do. I am paid for my judgment. People entrust that I'm going to make the right decisions on their behalf. And what we advertise and what we tell is so critically important to the entire healthcare system. We have to be honest, you know? Um, and so clinically proven means that it has been tested. We have had research that now meets a statistical significance. So it's not something that's a fluke. It is it has reached statistical levels where we feel very certain and we have strong confidence that this result reflects the majority of society, right? We believe that most people are gonna get this positive result. Now, clinically studied means nothing, right? I could study, I could say that arsenic is good for the skin and it's been, I'm clinically studying it. We know that it is not, right? I am not giving you a conclusion. <laughs> I am just telling you that I have chosen to study this area of science and it means nothing. And as physicians, we have to be very careful. And as consumers and as individuals, we have to be very critical and advocate for ourselves because that language um, is tricky. If you're clinically studying it, then let me know your preliminary studies. What does that even mean? You know, so I would not hang my hat on clinically studied. I could study anything, right? But what has been proven? What are you, what is your preliminary data? What are you seeing? What are the trends? And because something is being studied, it does let me know that um, this company at least is, um, is uh, dedicated to research and, and development enough that they're studying it, but it gives me zero conclusion. So it's kind of a, a hand clap. I'm glad you're doing that, but come back when you have something that you've proven or come back when you have some data that you can give me that I can make good clinical decisions on for my patients and as a consumer that you can make good decisions on for yourself. So um, there's actually a study, I know I'm going a little long, that shows um, that many patients forget whether a label says clinically proven or clinically studied. And I think maybe some bad actors are aware of that. And they realize that when people hear clinical, they forget proven or studied, and they just believe that the work has been done. So I encourage everyone to, you know, be good advocates for themselves and pay attention to that language. You are so smart. And this is why you do what you do. <laughs> and before you even gave me your answer, the whole time as you're speaking, I'm listening to you speak. And I, I somehow got I got um, lost in a, in a thought and I thought if she could have been anything but a dermatologist, she would have been a judge. I'm, I'm <laughs> serious. I'm, I kid you not. And then you go, you know, you, you go into your whole thing about, you know, it means nothing to me and you're judging it and people pay you for your judgment. I'm like, you see, <laughs> she would have in another life, she would have definitely been <laughs> Judge Henry. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. You're amazing thank at you. what you do. You're so easy to talk to. Thanks. I love that you are on top of the science, but you're also completely connected and invested with your audience and with with anybody that you're talking to you're in the moment and you're present and that is extremely important these days doctors are never in the moment when they're speaking they're never in the moment when they're talking to their patients at least for the most part they're busy and their head is spinning on who is the next patient and what they have to do but you kind of block everything out and and really kind of give it the time it needs which is extremely important thank you i really appreciate that that was our going deep segment brought to you by CO2lift.com. That was the amazing Dr. Michelle Henry, board certified dermatologic surgeon, speaker, trainer, and author. She's also the CEO and founder of Skin and Aesthetic Surgery of Manhattan. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this.
A Moment of Zen is brought to you by CO2 Lift. As we age, our skin loses moisture and elasticity, causing wrinkled skin. You can reverse this aging process with CO2 Lift. CO2 Lift utilizes the powerful benefits of carbon dioxide to lift, tighten, and regenerate your skin. This simple, painless at home carboxy therapy treatment is scientifically proven to reverse the aging process. You will see reduction in wrinkles, increase in luminosity, and improve pigmentation, sagging, skin tone, and radiance. For more information or to order CO2 Lift, go to CO2 Lift. Lift.com.